Today we bring some guitar geekery to the silver screen. You and I will be looking at some surprising guitar players that play pivotal roles in movie soundtracks. Hey TAC family, welcome to episode 196 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is all about bringing fun, focus, and progress to your guitar journey through my weekly Guitar Geek list, plus success stories from your fellow TAC members. The Drone Zone. Are you aware of it? It's where you play the same chords, the same songs, the same licks over and over and over and over again. Today, you're going to learn how to break out of the drone zone and make sure that you achieve progress every time you sit down with your guitar. You'll be meeting TAC member Marissa, who broke out of her four chord drone zone and is now trying something new and progressing every single time she plays her guitar. Plus, you're going to get your weekly dose of acoustic guitar news you can use, which includes some heavy metal acoustic guitar, a guitar geek treasure that will be brought to life again, and so, so, so much more. But first, let's explore some guitarists behind movie soundtracks. When it comes to movies, I feel like directors, actresses, actors, they get all the credit. They're always in the spotlight. But what about the music, man? What about the music? That's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna dig into five different guitar players behind the scenes making music for movies. So let's go ahead and dig in in a countdown fashion. Starting at number five, I wanna introduce you to Rye Cooter. Yes, indeed, Rye Cooter, a master musician in my opinion. And how I first heard of Rye Cooter was a movie. In fact, it was Paris, Texas. Released in 1984, I had a wonderful Dobro teacher at the time, Rob Anderlich, who said, you gotta get this soundtrack. I actually never saw the movie in the first place. I went ahead and got the Paris, Texas soundtrack and was whisked away into this amazing soundscape of slide guitar. It was one of my favorite soundtracks. It is one of my favorite soundtracks. So let's go ahead and listen to a little excerpt of it right now. Here's the main theme. Fun fact, Rye Cooter also did the music for Crossroads, which was released in 1986, and that movie's based on the Robert Johnson story. The movie features Ralph Macchio from The Karate Kid, and also making an appearance is Steve Vai. Steve Vai actually plays the devil in the movie during a guitar battle scene. It's pretty much must-watch TV or a must-see movie for any guitar geek. Let's move on to the number four position. And coming in at number four, in terms of a guitarist behind music in a movie, is Richard Thompson. Richard Thompson was responsible for the music for the Grizzly Man movie, which was a documentary released in 2005 about Timothy Treadwell, uh, an individual who lived amongst the bears. A bizarre movie, bizarre documentary. If you haven't seen it, I would put it on your list to go see. I saw it and I was like, whoa, this dude is, is pretty wild. He's living with the bears. Needless to say, it didn't end well, but that's not our focus here. We're talking about the music. Richard Thompson put together an incredible score for this movie. He played all but one song in this movie. In fact, the soundtrack was recorded in two days. Two days. Absolute music magic was captured. Let's take a listen to a track right now. Next up on my list is an artist I know you've heard of, and coming in at number three is Neil Young. Neil Young did the soundtrack for the movie Dead Man, which was released in 1995, and it starred Johnny Depp. Now, the music for the soundtrack is not completely acoustic, but the title track does feature an acoustic guitar. It's pretty catchy, it sounds awesome, so you know what, it fits the bill. Let's go ahead and listen to it right now. The 
The next artist on my list was a complete surprise to me. Now, I love the movie that this artist did the music for, but I had no clue that this artist did the music for the movie that I love. Are you following me so far? The artist coming in at number two is Mark Knopfler. And to the best of my knowledge and research, he's done soundtracks for four different movies. And the movie that I wanna feature was released in 1987, and it's entitled Princess Bride. One of my all time favorite movies. In fact, if you have not seen Princess Bride, you should see it right now. And I'm reminding myself that I need to actually rewatch the movie because yes, it is that good. While this movie is not entirely acoustic guitar, I did find a track. I did find a track that does feature a little acoustic guitar snippet. It's entitled, I Will Never Love Again. So we're gonna listen to that here in a moment, but what I noticed about the soundtrack is that not only was Mark Knopfler behind it, he did the composing and scoring for the movie soundtrack as well, which, is a whole much larger job than just simply sitting down and playing guitar. If you listen to the, the movie soundtrack, there's some pretty complicated movements. And yes, Mark Knopfler was behind that. But again, let's listen to a guitar-centered track entitled, I Will Never Love Again. The final artist on my list is responsible for me personally getting into bluegrass and folk music. The final artist on my list is largely responsible for reinvigorating the public's interest in bluegrass, folk, and Americana music. The final artist on my list coming in at number one is T-Bone Burnett. T-Bone Burnett has served as the executive music producer on countless films centered around bluegrass and folk music, namely, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? which is the exact soundtrack that got me into bluegrass music. But that's not the movie we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna focus on the Coen Brothers film Inside Lewin Davis, which T-Bone Burnett was the executive music producer on. And you might be thinking, executive music producer, that doesn't sound like a guitar player to me. He actually is a guitar player and he's a darn good one. But let's focus on his role as an executive music producer. What does that even mean? Is that somebody just sitting in a chair saying, here's a mixtape, use these songs? No, not really. Uh, T-Bone Burnett is responsible for choosing the songs and uh, making sure that they match the time period, making sure that they match the character's story. And it even goes as far as, he even goes as far as helping procure instruments that accurately reflect the time period, which I thought was super guitar geeky. So what we're gonna do is look at a clip from Inside Lewin Davis. It's the song where the characters are singing the, the tune, Please Mr. Kennedy. So we're gonna go from that clip to an interview with T-Bone Burnett where he talks about the development of that song and even purchasing an instrument. Here it is. Space. Ethan Cohen sent me a song from the 1960s, early 1960s, called Please, Mr. Kennedy, I Don't Want to Go to Vietnam. And uh, we didn't want to do a song about Vietnam, but we did want to do a song about outer space. So I wrote a set of lyrics and took them with me to go with Justin to uh, Norman's Rare Guitar Shop in the San Fernando Valley to go through guitars to find one for his character, Jim, to play. And we went through several, and as soon as we found one, we went into the office and he started writing the melody to please Mr. Kennedy in a coaster style, I would say. It sounded something like the coasters, old school. It's so awesome to pull back the curtain and see who's responsible for the music that we hear in major motion pictures. And speaking of music and movies, in the comments below, I want you to tell me what your favorite movie soundtrack is, and bonus points if you can name the artist behind it. When it comes to feeling progress on your guitar journey, there are two major enemies. The first one is the drone zone, and that's playing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Never trying anything new, never getting any better, never acquiring any new skills. The second enemy is distraction. 
And this comes in the form of sitting down, being all excited to play guitar, but never actually playing because you spend all your time deciding what to play. This exact scenario played out in TAC member Marissa's guitar journey. In fact, before she had a consistent guitar routine, here's what her life looked like. During COVID, I found this little mini Yamaha Junior guitar that I bought for my daughter over 10 years ago, and it was in the basement, and I decided to bring it on up because this was my turn. turn. I was going to learn how to play the guitar. So I picked it up, and I remembered the four or five chords I had in my youth growing up, and I was really psyched. I really wanted to learn the guitar. So every so often, I'd pick up that guitar, and I'd play a couple of songs, typically the songs I knew in high school. And um, I didn't really know how to get better, how to progress. Um, and I found very, very quickly that I was stuck in my four chord zone playing the same songs over and over again. So that's when I took to YouTube for some guidance. But mostly I got distracted with YouTube and, and quite overwhelmed. First off, I think it's amazing that Marissa decided to learn how to play guitar. I love that she dusted off the guitar that she purchased for her daughter and said, you know what? Now's my time. I'm going to learn the guitar right now. But she quickly found out that without a consistent guitar routine, she was all over the place. She wasn't getting any better. Well, let's fast forward and see what her life looks like now with a consistent guitar routine through Tony's Acoustic Challenge. Picking up the guitar every day and knowing I'm going to start with the daily challenge is key. There's no guesswork, no overthinking, no wasted time. Just my guitar lesson starts. And really in a short amount of time, I'm experiencing success with parts of those lessons or really bubbling over with excitement because I nailed the whole thing. Um, also tech is very goal oriented. So you make your own personal goals, short-term goals, long-term goals, and you can really measure your progress when you have goals in mind. Also with TAC, um, I'm now consistently reading and writing tabulature, which is so important because when I find something that's cool, I want to be able to notate that. Um, TAC is, is fun. Um, I remember after one lesson, it was a finger picking song called Flounder's Fiasco, and I was zoning out to it, finger picking, finger picking, sounding so cool to myself. And I said, this is so much better than those four chords I had. I'm actually finger picking a song. Finally, um, the TAC community is really um, a supportive and fun group and a safe place to just post your videos and, and chit chat with all the members. It's really a great community of guitar geeks. What an incredible journey so far. Marissa's guitar life started out full of distraction. She wasn't quite sure where to go. Then she implemented a consistent guitar routine. She's now having fun. She has direction. She's feeling progress every single time she sits down with the guitar. And that right there is absolutely huge when it comes to cultivating this positive momentum. You might be asking yourself, how do I cultivate this positive momentum? Well, let's go ahead and check in with Marissa because she offers quite a few tips for you. My guitar routine advice would be to be flexible and stay flexible. See, see what works for you. Look at the process. It might change. You might have to change your routine from time to time, but always try to build on what you have. Try to keep momentum going forward. I never look at a song now and say it's too difficult. Um, I just break it down into manageable chunks, whether it's a phrase or even a measure. And I feel success when I nail that measure. And then when you're done with the hard stuff, maybe end off with something that, um, that you really enjoy playing or that you play so well that you can always just leave it off on a high note. Because uh, the most important thing is playing the guitar should be fun. On behalf of all of us guitar geeks, I just want to say thank you to Marissa. I think it's so cool for all of us as a collective of guitar geeks to be able to look inside a fellow guitar geek's journey, to see what they struggle with, to see how they overcome those struggles, because that allows us to look at our own guitar journeys and maybe take a couple tips, take some of that advice and apply it into your own unique scenario. 
All right, let's visit another guitar geek. We're gonna head to Atlanta, Georgia, and we're gonna check out a guitar arsenal from James Burgess. Here's what he has in his guitar arsenal, starting from the left. An Eastman AC-222CE, an Alhambra 10P, an Eastman E20M, an Eastman E1D, an Eastman E6D12, a Taylor GS Mini Mahogany, and on the very far right, an Eastman E8D. Sitting next to him is a Tagima Classic Series T635, and in his hands is his new Martin D28. What an awesome guitar arsenal, James. And I have to say this, uh, clearly you're an Eastman fan, and that is for good reason. I think Eastman guitars offer an incredible guitar at a great price. And I think your guitar arsenal is proof of that. Thank you so much for sharing your guitar arsenal, James. And if you're sitting there thinking, I wanna be like James, now's the day. It is time for me to share my guitar arsenal on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Well, I want you to do so, and all you have to do is follow three simple steps. Step number one, visit AcousticTuesday.store and pick out your favorite guitar arsenal shirt. Step number two, once that shirt arrives, go ahead and put it on and take a picture amongst all of your guitars, just like James did. And step number three, please visit AcousticLife.tv. Once you're there, click on the submit link in the top menu. You can upload the picture of your guitar arsenal and tell us exactly what's in it. Let's head back to episode 190 of the Acoustic Tuesday show where I talked about acoustic guitar design elements and the impact that they have on the tone of your guitar. The comment section on that show, as predicted, was a bit of a frenzy, so I want to feature a few of those comments right now. The first one comes from Ryan Alvidres Ivy, and he says this, Scale length affects tone too. Longer scale lengths have more brightness, while Gibson scale lengths sound a bit more mellow. I've loved the looser feel and the tone of the latter. Uh, Ryan, you are dead on. Scale length has a huge impact on tone. Those longer scale lengths, 25 and a half, 25.4 inches, uh, they have a little bit more snap, a little bit more brilliance, brightness, as you mentioned, and sometimes uh, end up having a little bit more volume as well. Whereas the shorter scale lengths, think um, 24 and three quarter, 24.9 inches, those are perceived as a little bit warmer, sometimes maybe even a little bit quieter, but certainly, uh, uh, scale length has a huge impact on tone, as you mentioned. Our next comment comes from MP Kramer. He says this, hey Tony, how about sound hole size, shape, and placement, as well as multiple sound holes? Yes, that too has a huge impact on tone. I think the most notable example and the one that is a, is a clear illustration of sound hole size and how it impacts tone is the difference between a standard sound hole size versus an enlarged sound hole. Think, think Tony Rice's guitar, the, uh, the Martin Clarence White model or the Collings Winfield model. Those enlarged sound holes remove some of the woof out of those bigger body dreadnoughts and give a more clear punchy and accurate mid-range. So yes, indeed, sound hole, shape, size, diameter, that has a huge impact on tone as well. Our next comment comes in the form of a, a question as well. It comes from Lee Waite. He says this, Hi Tony, watching the show and I suddenly thought, does the pick guard affect the sound of your guitar? I've seen some, Gibsons I believe, that have pick guards on both sides of the sound hole. Yes, it does. Now, you know, in terms of, you know, tiny pick guard and bigger pick guard, I don't think there's huge dramatic difference between those. However, when you get into the Gibsons with the double pickguard, think the Gibson Everly Brothers model uh, with pickguards on both sides of the strings, that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of dampening on the top of the guitar. And if the top of the guitar is dampened in any way, shape, or form, that will impact the tone, namely, I think, the volume. So those, those guitars with the heavier pickguards, the double pickguards, although they may look cool, might have an impact on tone. But you know what? If it looks cool and, and you wanna play it, I'm not, I'm not gonna stop you. I know I've been enamored by many, many a guitar with, with dual pick guards, specifically some vintage Martins, but um, those just sound darn good. So maybe the pick guard has no effect on tone. I think it really does depend on the guitar, how it's built, the age of it, and of course the player as well. Let's move on to another comment here. This one comes from, I'm gonna try my best on this screen name. I'm probably gonna butcher it. Uh, Bora Cheech Lint, Bora Cheech Lint, sure. Uh, the comment says this, I can't stop focusing on bobblehead Tony's head shaking since the in-show comment. This was a couple episodes back. I recommend bobblehead Tony sits in for a segment and stops becoming merely a yes man. Uh, <laughs> That's an awesome comment. Uh, I, I never considered Bobblehead Tony as a yes man, but 
He clearly is, and I clearly have to find a different job for him here at the studio. But for now, he'll be my my little show companion. Uh, moving on to our final comment. This comes from Ryan Chen Music. He says this. I see how you sidestepped the tone with debate there. And I did, Ryan. I, I, you caught me red-handed. You know, when talking about acoustic guitar design elements, I said Tonewood has a huge impact on tone, and I only chose mahogany and rosewood uh, because, well, there are so many different Tonewoods. I feel like we could do like a 24-hour Acoustic Tuesday show only about Tonewoods. So yeah, I didn't want to open that can of worms on that particular episode. But uh, thanks everybody for the comments. It's so it's it's always so wonderful to hear from you. Thank you for being a part of this community, and I always welcome your questions, your show topic recommendations. If you have anything you want me to know, just throw it in the comments. It is time. It's time for acoustic guitar news you can use, and I hope you're ready because you're gonna laugh, you're gonna cry, you might be scared. You might be surprised. I've got a whole slew of things that I cannot wait to tell you about. And the first one isn't even guitar related. It's not even acoustic guitar related. It's actually bass related, but it really involves music and having insane passion for playing. I want to introduce you to Aaron the Bassist. Uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, Aaron is 10 or 11 years old. And when this kid plays bass, he absolutely feels the music. And I just want you to note his quote unquote bass face. Here's a clip. And turn it all around. This one thing. Oh, yeah. I don't want you to run. I know. I know. I can deliver. Oh, I've been delivered. I've been delivered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been separated. Every change. Every change. I have to say, I love seeing him play. I've watched a ton of different uh, videos on his YouTube channel and he just gets into the music. He just feels the groove, and it's very evident by, again, his bass face. Strongly recommend you check out Aaron, uh, some of the songs that he covers on YouTube. Just a, um, just seems like a cool kid, just a cool kid. So cheers to you, Aaron. Uh, the next piece of news I have for you comes from Norm's Rare Guitars. Now, I was surfing their Instagram profile, and I found out that Norm has a book out, Norm's Confessions of a Vintage Guitar Dealer. It's available on his site, and, uh, I haven't read it yet, but it is on my list to read. What a cool sounding book. So of course, since I found out about it, I wanted to tell you about it as well. Now, the next piece of news on my list is what I'll call heavy metal acoustic guitar. This is Alexander Misko covering a Ramstein song on his acoustic guitar. And wow, does he capture every essence of the tune. Here it is. Now I want you to take note because that's not the only heavy metal acoustic guitar you're gonna hear on today's episode. That's just simply one example. And I think uh, Alexander did a great job. Uh, just so cool. Again, I, I'm always infatuated by how these guitar players arrange songs that aren't really made for the acoustic guitar, but somehow translate really well to the acoustic guitar. Okay, I've got another news nugget for you, and this is kind of, uh, what's the wedding saying? Uh, something borrowed, something blue, something old, something new. This is something borrowed and something old, kind of. Iris Guitars just purchased some old tops from the old Guild Factory. Yes, they're gonna use these on special orders. Let me go ahead and read the post for you. It says this. Allied Luthery acquired over 150 old Guild tops that never made the move from Rhode Island to California. Luckily, and crazy stupid, Guild didn't want to buy them to use. So we bought them and we'll be using them on special orders. Looking forward to hearing the first Iris with an old Guild Sitka top. What a cool story. I love to hear that. First of all, I just think Iris guitars are amazing. This is so cool. And this is, this is, this right here, this piece of news is likely going to push me over the edge because something about an Iris guitar that has this dry woody sound with an old guild top on it. I think it's going to be a match made in heaven. Time will tell. Time will tell. Now I've got one more piece of news for you. And I know I've talked about heavy metal acoustic guitar quite a bit. This one is top of the heap for me. 
You might not know this about me, but I am a Slayer fan. Whitney and I actually saw Slayer in concert three summers ago, and it was a great show. It was incredible. One of my favorite songs, one of many Slayer fans' favorite songs, is Raining Blood. And the song is definitely not made for the acoustic guitar. But leave it up to Marcin Patrzalik. I know I didn't say the last name correctly, but on Instagram, his handle is Marcin Music, M-A-R-C-I-N dot music. He covered Raining Blood on the acoustic guitar. I have to say I was speechless after watching it. I thought he did an incredibly good job. And as a metalhead, it made me smile from ear to ear. Ear to ear. Here to there, ear to ear. Here he is. And on those heavy metal notes, I think it's a great time to wrap up the show for today. Plus, I'm running out of words. I'm mashing words together, creating new words. So yeah, I think it's a good time to wrap up the show for today. But first, let's take a sneak peek into next week. And next week, we'll be taking a sneak peek. See what I did there? Yes, next week, we're going to look inside my guitar case and see what I bring to every single gig. The accessories I simply cannot live without. I've got about 10 of them for you, and I'm going to share those with you next week. Be sure to catch Acoustic Tuesday, well, every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. here on YouTube. I thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me. And remember this, your guitar success, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in developing your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. Thank you again for joining me today. Guitar Geeks Unite, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers.